Hello there, everybody. This is Al Blumkin. We are back with another session of uh, David Nemec's Baseball History and Trivia. And uh, we're going to be discuss discussing today the 1920s from 1921 to 1930. Uh, and there may be some uh, conversation about Babe Ruth in this uh, particular podcast. I want to welcome David, and I want to welcome our uh, other regular in, this, in these uh, podcasts, uh, Ian Kahnowitz. Thank you, Al. Both again. Okay, so uh, last week we left off at 1920. In 1921, uh, the uh, 44 Yankee, uh, season Yankee dynasty started, and uh, Babe Ruth, of course, became the talk of baseball with... Uh, the season for the ages where he hit, uh, I believe it was 59 home runs. He uh, walked and uh, scored a tremendous number of runs, 177 runs, which I don't think has been broken. And I think he that, scored eight forty seven that season. Yeah, it was an incredible year. Uh, and that, that was uh, led to the World Series that for the first time ever it was all played in one park. Yeah, they put. Uh, he was telling me for the polo grounds. Yeah, yeah. When the Yankees picked him, when the Yankees picked him up, uh, he would have really struggled uh, for his career had he stayed in Boston. Uh, it would have been a very different career. He may have actually stayed a pitcher a bit longer, if not, uh, you know, if not for the not for the move. But uh, you know, by, by by the time he hit nineteen, by twenty nine homers in nineteen nineteen. It was pretty clear that he had to be in the lineup every day, one way or another. Yeah, they also, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, faced the Giants in the World Series of Pirates. I think, uh, if I uh, remember my reading correctly, uh, blew a lead uh, to the Giants in uh, August of 1921, and the Pirates had come in for a five-game series. Uh, and they lost all five of them to the Giants, and uh, the Giants uh, wound up winning that pennant, and then uh, you know it became a whole thing with Ruth and McGraw and the World Series, which uh, for the last time was being played in uh, nine games, and uh, the uh, Giants won the series five games to three, and Ruth didn't have a particularly good series. No, no, but uh, but it was a breakthrough season because they, the Yankees uh, won their first pennant. Uh, no one then had any inkling, of course, that uh, with it by the end of the 20th century they would you know, already have a pennant total that would probably probably be unsurpassable for at least the next century, if not longer, uh, if baseball indeed lasts that long. And other teams, too, broke through in the 20s. Uh, Washington won its first pennant. Uh, and by the, end, by the end of the 20s, with one exception, every team of the, of the original 16 franchises that began in 1901 had won at least one pennant. That one exception was the St. Louis Browns. And the 1922 season was theirs for the taking. And they fell just short uh, the season has been called in Brown's history, close but no cigar. Um, well, what happened in that season is that uh, there was a rule against uh, players from the uh, World Series teams going to Barnstorm after the season. And uh, Ruth and the, the Yankee left fielder, Bob Musil, violated that rule at the time, which was, you know, was, which was absurd because uh, you know, there was a way of Ball players to supplement their income, and Landis uh, threw the book at both Ruth and Musil and suspended them for uh, the first, uh, I think, the first month of the season. Yeah. And Ruth uh, didn't play; they didn't play until the, the middle of May. And uh, uh, Ruth, uh, yeah, for him, a very mediocre season. Yeah, and it was. Saying, it, it was. You know, he was, uh, he would have set you know, an un almost unimaginable uh, streak for, you know, home run crowns had it not been for 1922. He ended up, uh, because he set out so many games and 
uh, didn't come back in the best of shape. Uh, he ended up losing the home run title to Ken Williams, a very, very good hitter in his own right, uh, for the, uh, of the St. Louis Browns. Oh, and, uh, Ken Williams, a Cy Williams, uh, who was a, a big home run hitter in the National League, uh, for the, really was the dominant home run hitter for the National League in the early part of the 1920s. Uh, they, they, uh, William Schiff actually originated with these two left-handed hitters. They were the first, uh, to bring infielders playing, you know, bringing, bringing them over to the right side of the diamond, the shortstop, and bringing the outfield, uh, you know, radically around to the right. And, uh, both of them were very, very good hitters, uh, all-around hitters, and Ken in particular is, I think, in my opinion, uh, a marginal Hall of Famer, never gotten the recognition he deserved, in part because he never played on that on that pennant winning Browns team that uh, was came very close. Well, in 1922, George Sisler had a season for the ages. Uh, he had 420, uh, two I think it was 420, right? He had 420. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, had the, his overall best season. He had he had hit 407 in uh, 1920, and uh, he just had it was you know a tremendous tremendous ball player. And unfortunately for him, is that he had a sinus uh, condition which caused him to miss the entire 1923 season, and he was never really the same. No, he wasn't. And do you want to discuss the opening at Yankee Stadium? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to discuss, if you don't, um, if, even before we get that, because I think uh, going back to 1921, we got a lot of good things that uh, we haven't touched about. Uh, about. First of all, um, like you mentioned, the Yankees purchased a 20-acre plot of land in the Bronx for the future side of the Yankee Stadium. But more important than even than that, during an August 19th doubleheader between the Tigers and Red Sox, Ty Cobb became the youngest player at 34 ever to reach 3,000 hits. No one has ever done that that young. No. Um, no, no one has ever done that yet, that young. Jimmy Dykes handled an American League record 17 chances at second base for the Philadelphia A's as they took on the St. Louis Browns at Sportsman's Park on August 28th. Uh, Dykes averaged up 120 five games and 13 full seasons with the A's, but only once played the same position all year, second base in 1921. And then in the National League, what was going on, um, July 8th at um, Mr. Blumpkin's favorite place, Forbes Field, the fans were allowed to keep the balls that were hit into the stand. <laughs> they were at an also just... First, at, though... Uh, because a, a Charlie Wiggum in, in Chicago yeah. had allowed, uh, when he took over the Cubs, allowed allowed fans to keep the balls at uh, what was then Wiggum, Wiggum Field and became what we now know, of course, as Wrigley. But, uh, yeah, I, I believe Charlie might have, I think he was the first owner that uh, did it. Uh, but yep. and, but it still was a custom throughout, throughout the major, major League Baseball not to let fans keep the keep the balls and some teams the Yankees for one uh would actually fight fans to get the balls back and there were some incidents that led to legal suits into into the late 1930s so uh you know Ian has brought up a very very interesting facet of the game that uh is little known and yeah I and I I had forgotten that myself yeah, having uh in this decade uh uh, you know, almost went out of sight because of the rules that were put in and, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, ban the trick pitches and to, uh, uh, you know, change, put in clean baseballs. And maybe even livelier baseballs. Yeah. It's still for grabs. It's, the debate, uh, rages on and probably will for, you know, into eternity, whether or and not the balls were, you know, go for it up a bit. In the 1922 World Series, the uh, the uh, Giants beat the Yankees four games to zero, and uh, there was a tie. And what happened in that game was that uh, 
uh, the umpire called it with a, of course there was no night baseball back then. Uh, they called it with a good uh, amount of daylight left. And it was such an outcry that uh, the receipts from that game, I think, uh, when this had them donated to charity. Do you remember who the umpire was? I don't. I think it was George uh, Hillebrand. George Hillebrand? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember reading played. that, uh, you know, quite a while ago. Yeah. But it's... Um, we probably should. We, we really haven't talked much about the umpires uh, and the changes in umpiring that, that occurred as the 20th century progressed. Uh, it began uh, with still a lot of games being played with a single umpire, and you know by the end of the first decade, it, the two umpire system was in play. Uh, but by the 20s, they started to go to three umpires. But it's still there was still a ways off from having four umpires. Uh, on a regular basis, and uh, umpiring was was uh, there were a lot of a lot of ex major leaguers who who became very very fine umpires, and some of them never received their due. I, I what immediately comes to my mind every time we talk about umpires is Bill Deneen, who, in my opinion, uh, belongs in the Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, I think he should have been in the Hall of Fame before Hank O'Day. And there are a number of other umpires in the early part of the 20th century who couldn't hold the candle to Bill, Bill's all-around achievements in baseball. Uh, and he was a fine umpire and umpired World Series games into the 20s, and he umpired in the first All-Star game. There really isn't anything in his dossier that uh, he, he doesn't have uh, except uh, that Hall of Fame recognition. Very, very interesting. And I, I agree with yeah, I agree yeah. with Dave. I agree with Dave because in 1921, um, you know, you you have more of the umpires. We have I was the three umpires, right, Dave? Yeah, we had, we're, they were yeah. starting to have three. But um, in 1921, the umpires in both leagues began the practice of rubbing the mud into the balls prior to each game in order to remove the gloss from the ball. So um, umpires were gaining more of a hands-on approach at the time uh, in uh, what I like to say is the golden age of baseball. Yeah, and where were they getting? And where were they getting that mud? They were getting it from um, Lena Blackburn, an ex-major league player, who um, I believe what did he have? It was almost like a swamp, I think. Yeah, some sort of mud that he, yeah, and it, that he invented the mud, you know. I think in Delaware, uh, <laughs> Delaware Basin. Well, and I don't know what was so special about it, but uh, he got a lot of recognition for it. And his, you know, his, his name, uh, you know, is a very, very small type in, in uh, as far as his playing career goes, but uh, looms large in history because it that went on for a long time. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, 1923, of course, was the first year of Yankee Stadium. And, of course, in the inaugural game, it was uh, uh, christened by a uh, home run by Babe Ruth. And the Yankees uh, beat the Red Sox. The Red Sox, by that point, had been totally decimated. I think there was something like six or seven members from the 1918 Red Sox uh, that were the last the Red Sox team uh, you know, to win the World Series back then that wound up on the 1923 Yankees. And as Everett Scott and uh, uh, I think Wally Shang, uh, and of course, so you know, and uh, Panic and uh, uh, yeah, there, were, there were a whole bunch of them that uh, came, that Boston uh, and uh, under Frazee had sold everybody to, you know, basically everybody worth of uh, Anything was sold to the Yankees except for Harry Hooper, who went to the White Sox. <laughs> and uh, the Red Sox became the uh, doormats of the American League for uh, the rest of that decade. They were they were probably the worst team in baseball for much of the 20s, you're right. And they supplanted the A's, who were uh, you know, finished last uh, every year from 1915 through 19, I think it was 1922. Yeah. Can you guys hold a second? Because I got 
come back. Uh, I got to restart this. Uh, forget. I'm, somebody's trying to get a hold of me. I can't get off the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, yeah, of course. All right. I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Uh, hold on. Hey. Okay. We're back. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, but so in 1923, the Yankees finally beat the Giants in the World Series, and uh, uh, the Giants in those years had uh, a lot of Hall of Famers, most of whom were put in by uh, Frankie Frisch when he was on the Veterans Committee. Yeah, but Kelly and Travis Jackson and the Fred, no, Fred Lindstrom didn't come up till 1924. Late. Ross Youngs, a bunch of these guys who were put in. Yeah, they were very, very. They were good ball players, but none of them had had anything near the credentials that uh, you know earlier Hall of Famers. I, mean, I think did. the only one you can even make a case for is uh, is Jackson. A very slim case. Yeah, yeah. he was. There were there were better shortstops. They you know and, there are, they, and some of them are in the Hall of Fame. Dave Bancroft, of course, and, and, yeah. and Joe. Uh, Bancroft mostly for his defense, but he was a pretty good, pretty good offensive player too. And he started uh, when average and when batting started pick up to pick up throughout baseball. Bancroft joined joined the club and had some very very good years at the plate. Yeah, another the another very good one was uh, M.O. Musil, the uh, a brother of uh, uh, Bob. Bob Musil, and uh, uh, they also had an outfielder from 21 through 23 by the name of Charles Dillon Stengel. <laughs> Who would uh, Casey? Uh, Casey, exactly, yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, Casey he, uh, was in his early thirties at that back then. He still looked like uh, he, he was old. <laughs> was it was it the twenty two series that he won, or the twenty three series where he won a game with an yeah. arc run? Yeah, twenty three. Twenty three. Yeah. It was twenty three because it was he was yeah. the first one to ever hit a home run in Yankee Stadium. Uh, in the, I think it was in the World Series, if I'm not Yeah, in the World Series, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was in the World Series. It was in the inside the park home run, I think. Yeah, and the yeah. ace of that, I think the ace of that pitching staff back then was a pitcher by the name of Art Neff. Neff uh, won two games, won two final games in a World Series, back to back, went back to back season. Happy be 21 and 22. Two, yeah. I, I don't, it's, Nobody else has ever done did it be, done it before or since. Uh, I don't, you know. It's uh, no, no. He, I think he's the only one. Yeah, he was quite a good, good, you know, a very good pitcher. Uh, but pitchers in those years were sadly neglected. Uh, there were there were great, some very fine pitchers, but they had hugely inflated ERAs and WHIPs and so forth by modern standards. And as a result, they never got the recognition they deserved. George Uli was another fine pitcher. George Doss was a you know really good pitcher. Uh, the National League had its share too. You know, some did make the Hall of Fame eventually, like Burley Grimes, but uh, and and the Jesse Jesse Haynes somehow stuck in. But oh God! Got me started from, uh, on that one. Pitchers and hey, me started on Jesse Haynes. Yeah. But, yeah. but Dave, is, Dave is right. There were a few good pitches. Hmm. Um, and, you know, you still had Walter Johnson in 23 on May 22nd. Uh, on May 2nd. You know, he pitched a 3 nothing shutout, and that was the 100th career shutout of his career. Uh, because, again, it was, the, it was the era of the live ball. And so the event went virtually unnoticed. In addition, on July 20, 22nd, he was the first one to join the 3,000 strikeout club, Walter Johnson. Well, his, also, not, his strikeout numbers were exceptional because when he was striking uh, batters out, nobody else was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he was just, uh, I, I consider him the best pitcher of all time. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to make a case against him. I, You know, I think Alexander is the only one who who gives him really strong competition. And uh, unfortunately, they never they never met in postseason, but uh, would, it would have been interesting. Well, in 1924, which was uh, turned out to be the only year that Babe Ruth uh, won a batting title, they wound up uh, finishing uh, behind uh, uh, 
the Senators what? who won their first pennant ever. And uh, they were playing, the, they faced the Giants in the World Series, and uh, they, uh, Bucky Harris, who was, uh, I think, I believe something like 27 years old, uh-huh. was the player manager there for Washington, and uh, he outfoxed the great McGraw in the last game because he got the, you know, the devised a strategy to get the rookie uh, uh, Bill Terry out of the lineup in the last game. Yeah. He's got, uh, he's, he's, I think it was Curly. It was Curly Ogden. He penciled in to start, and I think yeah. Ogden pitched one batter. And then Ogden was a left-hander, and, and McGraw. So McGraw, must, who did he start? Kelly in that game? Yeah. Instead? At first, and then uh, you know, here's Ogden after pulled after I think after one batter and yeah. a right-hander in, and uh, you know McGraw was was you know had to eat crow. Um, but yeah, and then Walter Johnson, who uh, didn't win any games up to that point, uh, came in relief, and then uh, with uh, some shenanigans in the bottom of the tenth inning, where uh, a ball hit by. Uh, uh, McNeely, the immortal Earl McNeely. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, and uh, hit a pebble, and right before that, uh, uh, the uh, giant catcher Hank Gowdy uh, stepped into his own mess, chasing a foul ball. Yeah. On uh, yeah. off the bat of I think it was uh, Muddy Rule, and he got a hit, and uh, gi- the Giants. It was sort of like the 1912 series. Very close to the 1912. Yeah. yeah. And Washington uh, won that. Uh, yeah, the so pebble, the ball bounced head at third base, and that was it. Yeah, everybody was court. happy for Walter Johnson because he finally, after toiling for 17 years, you know, for that team, which is, uh, you know, wasn't uh, very pleasant most of the time, finally got a World Series. And then they won the next year. They won the pennant, and uh, that was the year of Babe Ruth, uh, had More his, uh, you know, belly ache. belly ache or venereal disease or whatever it was, and <laughs> missed the uh, in spring training, missed a good portion of the season, and then he uh, was suspended later in the season by Miller Huggins for uh, uh, violating curfew or whatever. I don't remember the exact uh, you know circumstances of the suspension, but this, he uh, he's fined five thousand dollars. And uh, uh, he went to Ru- Jacob Rupert screaming about it, and Rupert backed Noah Huggins. So Ruth has a ter- had a terrible season, and uh, uh, despite the uh, you know the, the uh, presence of rookie Lou Garrett for his first season, uh, the Yankees finished in seventh, and that was the last time they would finish worse than fourth until uh, 1965. Yeah, yeah. Ruth, it wasn't all clover for Ruth in the 1920s. And in the following year, 1926, he ended the World Series. Uh, he represented a potential tying run in Game 7. The Yankees were playing the Cardinals and was on first base and tried to steal second with two out to put himself in scoring position and was thrown out, I think, well, by Bob O'Farrell. Well, in 1920, yeah, go ahead, Dave. And that was yeah, you know, that ended the world. He end, so he ended the World Series uh, rather ignominiously. Um, well, we got to 1926. In uh, uh, 1925, Washington took a three to one lead in the World Series against the Pirates, who had finally broken through uh, and won the National League pennant. And uh, the Pirates stormed back and uh, won the uh, last three games to become the first team ever to come back. In a seven-game series from a, th- from a three-to-one deficit to win the series, and uh, you know it was a, a bit of a surprise to everybody. And this is uh, uh, this was before uh, the Wainers appeared. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it was a deception-ridden team for much of the season because Bill McKechnie was the manager, uh, and Bill, Mc- Bill was a former player for the Pirates, uh, and. Uh, they, and the Pirates brought back Fred Clark, their old manager from, you know, 
the teens and, and the aught years uh, who've been who've done very well to uh, kind of be an assistant uh, assistant manager, and uh, that led to you know players siding with one, either McKechnie or Clark, and there was a lot of friction in the dugout, and even on and even carried over to the field. Yet the Pirates still still prevailed and put together a very good team. But it was, it was McKechnie's first pennant. Uh, and he went on to have an extraordinarily fine Hall, uh, Hall of Fame managerial career. The uh, uh, 1926 uh, was a year of the emergence of the Cardinals. Yeah, because uh, as we mentioned last week, they were a dirt, dirt poor team, uh, and probably the worst uh, team in the uh, National League overall during the dead ball era. And uh, Branch Rickey went there after he was fired by uh, uh, Phil Ball, who uh, owned the St. Louis Browns. He went across town and uh, built the team up. And that was the decade in the National League of uh, Rogers Hornsby, who uh, over a six-year period from 1920 to 1925 hit uh, close to 400 uh, collectively for those six years. In 1926, he became the player manager, and they won. Uh, they won uh, uh, the pen, even though his numbers dropped quite considerably. They won the pennant for the first time, and then uh, beat the Yankees in a seven-game series. In 1926, uh, it was noted for uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander, who uh, in the seventh game came back in relief after pitching the sixth game and they struck out Tony Lazari with the bases lower than the seventh inning to keep a one run lead and then in the uh, you know as David just mentioned that uh, you know, Babe Ruth tried to steal a uh, second base in the uh, ninth inning of the seventh game and uh, was thrown out and that ended the series Ruth had come back in 1926 with a big year he had promised uh Rupert, after the disastrous 1925 season, that he would get into shape, uh, playing shape for 1926, and he did. And, uh, Ian, would you like to add something on the emergence of Garrett? Six, you had Wally, you had Wally Pip at the time, and, um, <laughs> Garrett came in, um, you know, um, and don't forget, Wally Pitt was there for 11 seasons, 10 and a half years. And now you got this fresh kid, uh, a rookie from Columbia University named Lou Garrick, um, who would hold the position for 2,130 consecutive games at first, play, at first base. So, you know, um, you know, Garrick uh, came in and he would, um, take the reins and literally um, be in Root's shadow, although if he was by himself, Garrick, um, he would have been the major star in any other team. I would follow with the with the Babe until 1935, until uh, Babe was traded uh, to the uh, Boston Braves. But um, he's my favorite Yankee, Lou Garrick. I don't think, I think besides being a great player, he was a, a, an amazing human being. Um, uh, he was not like Ruth in any aspect. Uh, he was a good Christian. Um, he was a uh, good to his family. He was good to his wife, and um, he really was the iron horse. He could not only put it in the stands, but he could hit for average and and run for the diggers and play our first base. And uh, it's just a shame in his later career that he got sick and, of course, died at the age of 38. You know, yeah, nobody. Uh, I've read that nobody has ever hit a ball as hard as he did uh, that consistently. Yeah, I mean, and he had rockets. Of course, and of course and his, you know, his, you know, consecutive game streak, uh, which seemed unbeatable until late uh, when Ripken came along. Uh, nobody ever thought when when Gary left the game that anyone anyone would ever come close to his consecutive games record he and he hung in he was beamed in an exhibition game and came back and still played the next game 
at least long enough to get penciled into the lineup and get get his name on the scorecard. And uh, I di- just didn't miss the game. Once once he took over, that was it. You know, Pip never saw uh, never saw his name at penciled in at first base again for the Yankees. In 1927, uh, the Yankees had an incredible year. Well, maybe before we should go back to 26 for one minute. If, if, uh, one thing we haven't talked about much at all uh, since the 1919 World Series is the Cincinnati Reds. And in 1926, uh, they had a pretty pretty good team. In fact, they were, they were right in the race until the very end. They finished only two games uh, back of the Cardinals. And to say something about the game, how different it was then as, as far as record keeping and, uh, batting titles and, you know, earned run average titles and so forth. Uh, the batting title in, in 1926 went to, uh, catcher for the Reds, Bubbles Hargrave, uh, who hit, uh, he hit 353. And right behind him was a teammate, Cuckoo Christensen, an outfielder, who hit 350. Now, those are those are good averages in any year, but neither of these guys by t- by today's standards would have come anywhere near close to c- qualifying for the batting title. The rules were very liberal then. In the National League, you simply had to play 100 games. Uh, in the American League, that persisted too for a number of years. Uh, actually, in that it, it finally came to a challenge in 1938, when a rookie named Taft Wright played 100 games, but only had 200 and some at-bats for the White Sox and had the highest batting average. He was denied the batting title. He was the first one to play 100 games ever to not get not get credit for a batting title when he had the highest average. But, in the, you know, the, the, the uh, seasons were riddled with leaders, uh, particularly in the hitting hitting categories and the batting averages. There were a lot of, a lot of players who didn't have the necessary credentials by today's standards. And one thing that was also starting to creep into the game uh, was the use of relief pitchers. And uh, by the end of the end of the 1930 season, uh, there still weren't pitchers who were exclusively relief pitchers. And the pitcher who held the record at that time in 1930 and lasted until 1942 for the most games pitched in the major leagues without ever making a start was a marginal is a marginal hall of famer but not not as a pitcher uh he came up as a pitcher lefty o'duel never got a start in the major leagues but he pitched 34 games total and that was that uh nobody else at that time made an exclusive career as a as a reliever and that wouldn't have been his career either because there weren't any careers exclusively for relievers you had to be able to make starts now and then and even the better relief pitchers like Hal Haid and High Bell and uh, guys like that, they, they could make starts on occasion. Uh, and, you know, but Purple Marbury, uh, who was with Washington and a teammate of Johnson's, was the first really to make uh, relief pitching, pitching a special, special niche. Uh, he also started on occasion, and he was a good starter, but as a, it was as a relief pitcher that he really made his, made his name in baseball. So there were a lot of things about the game that were changing in the 1920s, and there were some interesting little, you know, statistical aspects in particular that I think, you know, do, do deserve some notation. Yeah, one thing I want to mention is that after the 1926 season, uh, the Cardinals uh, traded uh, Hornsby, who had fallen, even though he managed the team to the World Series, had fallen out of favor with the Cardinal owner Sam Breeden, to the Giants for Frankie Frisch, who had fallen out of favor with John McGraw. And this was the first trade, and I still think the only trade, where two uh, Hall of Famers were traded for each other. And both played the same position. Both playing the same position. And uh, Frisch went on to play uh, in the former World Series with the Cardinals. He's pl- he played in eight World Series, which is the most by any player ever who... Uh, uh, never put in a Yankee uniform. And, uh, Hornsby, uh, uh, started to make the rounds. And he didn't settle until he, uh, went to the Cubs in 1929. The Giants sent him to the Braves after 1927 because McGraw and he didn't get along. And then, uh, he was sent to, uh, the, the, the Cubs by the Braves because the Braves couldn't afford him. 
And uh, so by the end of by the end of the 1920s, Rogers Hornsby had played with four you know four different teams and yeah. you know back to back seasons. Yeah, for four and years in four years. He, yeah, yeah, for three of them he set what still stands today is a record for the highest season, seasonal batting average for a member of that franchise. Uh, he has the, he, he owns the highest for the Cubs, he owns the highest for the Braves, and he owns the highest for the Cardinals, of course. And uh, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal hitter, and uh, probably will never get the recognition for, for you know that he deserved. But he was also a, he was also a miserable S.O.B. Hornsby. Yeah, he did. He wasn't, he wasn't everybody's favorite, that's for sure. Yeah, cause Landis uh, used to call him on the uh, carpet for uh, uh, periodically because he always be liked the best horses, and he used to have the clubhouse boys run uh, bets for him because the track yeah, was during, during the night time back then. Yeah. Yeah, when he's playing well, for the Brave, particularly true because they were a terrible team, and yeah, you know, he, his head wasn't really all, always in the game. And, that, and then we get to 1927. So before we even get there, Al, I just have yeah, one sure. thing to say. The okay. trip speaker, um, the trip speaker, and uh, Ty Cobb affair happened in uh, yeah. in 1926, and uh, that's I think we need to touch upon that because again, this is 63 years before uh, Pete Rose was banned permanently from the game. And uh, for those who don't know, because it's not well talked about, uh, American League President Ben Johnson um, asked both Trish Speaker and Detroit manager Ty Cobb, of course, to resign their posts after Dutch Leonard uh, claimed that uh, he had evidence to show that Speaker and Cobb uh, fixed at least one game between Cleveland and Detroit back in 1919. Um, and so what happened was uh, one, it, it became a matter of – uh, black marking the sport again because, you know, as the sport was growing, uh, people started coming out, and the 1919 um, Black Sox were behind everyone, um, people took an interest in it. I and mean, it was big news at the time. Um, again, Dutch Leonard uh, was a pitcher, and he was upset with Cobb and Speak there after a trade ended uh, with Leonard in the minor leagues. And when um, and when uh, Leonard broke the story, both uh, Cobb and, Sp- and Speaker resigned um, and because of the pressure from Ben Johnson, as I uh, um, you know, indicated. But Commissioner Landis um, called a hearing, and when Dutch Leonard refused to appear at the January 5th, 1927 hearings to discuss his accusations, Commissioner Landis cleared both Speaker and Cobb of any wrongdoing. Uh, both were reinstated to their original teams, but each team declared its manager free to sign elsewhere. Speaker didn't return to the big leagues managing, and he finished his uh, ma- uh, MLB uh, manager career with a 617-520 record. Now, uh, Speaker signed, I think, with the Washington Senate. Yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Seven. And then Seven, Cobb yeah. joined the A's, and then Speaker joined Cobb. But what I want to point out is is that Ju- uh, Judge Landis's um, stance on the record was very different uh, than uh, the White Sox, um, the eight men out, you know, a few years before, um, especially when you look at the paradox between the two. Those eight players were um, exonerated. They they were they were free by a jury, but Landis made a, a um, uh, an example of them to like. Well, there's not going to be any black mark in baseball. But now we're coming back, you know, four or five years later, and now there is evidence because I've seen those letters that Dutch Leonard uh, produced. However, it is subject to interpretation. Nothing specifically mentions these things. It can all be inferred if you look at it a certain way. And to Landis, that wasn't clear evidence that both Speaker and Cobb uh, had done the deed. Well, there wasn't evidence for a lot of other players he he did kick out. He kicked out Ray Fisher, a very good pitcher, simply because he banned Fisher for life. 
simply because he refused to sign, uh, renew his contract with the with the Reds, and instead left left baseball to coach at Michigan, University of Michigan, and that band stood until you know long in, deep into the 20th century. Uh, so he he had, he had some very very peculiar notions as to what should constitute a ban and uh, be something that baseball should never forgive uh, because, of, uh, you know, pitch, Fisher was a good pitcher, didn't get a contract he liked, decided to take the Michigan job. It, he was a free man. There was nothing, nothing in the rules in the least, in the slightest, that uh, should have, you know, uh, justified even a suspension, let alone being kicked out of the game. Okay, now what can we get to 1927? 1927. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting on that. That's fine. That's no no problem. No, that uh, that's, that's yeah, a, a lot very of, a lot of people don't know about that. Yeah, it's it's that's, yeah. that's really really yeah, uh, uh, you know, an incident in the game that does bear a lot more inspection <laughs> forgotten. The uh, the uh, 1927 was the year of murderers row for the Yankees. They won 110 games uh, against 44 losses. I think they beat the Browns 21 out of 22 times that that season, which is still the uh, yeah, which was a record for uh, most wins against one team in the season in the uh, uh, 20th century. And uh, they had a powerhouse team. Garrett, Ruth, Ruth at 60, Garrett at 47. They had more home runs than any other team in, uh, in the American League. And uh, backed up by pitchers, uh, Wade Hoyt, Terpanek, uh Urban Shocker, and Wilson Moore. Uh, they, they just blew away everybody else in the American League. And nationally, the Pirates won. And the Pirates had a big problem. Pirates had a Hall of Fame player named Kai Kai Kyler, who didn't get along with uh, Tony Bush, who was the manager of that team. And Bush, uh, soon after uh, the midseason, wanted Kyler to bat second. And Kyler had a a fixation about batting second. He did not, for uh, whatever reason, did not want to do it, and he refused. So uh, Bush benched him for the rest of the season. He only played in 85 games. Uh, they were swept by the Yankees in the World Series in four straight. And the Kyle was traded by the Pirates to the Cubs after 1927. And he went on to uh, continue a, a career that wound up, uh, wound up uh, putting him in the Hall of Fame. But it was a very, very strange uh Situation. I don't think anything like that has ever really uh, uh, come up to that extent since, when a manager wouldn't play a player because he wouldn't bat in a certain certain position. Who who replaced him in the lineup? Dude? I, I don't. Yeah, I can't think of. Well, who it was. the two winers, and uh, I forget who the third outfield was. But obviously, he wasn't uh, the same class with uh, with uh, Kaikai Kaiwa. Uh, I'm trying to remember that. That was that was a very strange. It was yeah. very 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 weird. And the Yankees just uh, you know that was the Yankees would start uh, that first of three World Series that they appeared in that they would sweep in uh, four games. The next year, 1928, uh, the Yankees were expected to run right run away with it, and they were challenged. Uh, by the Philadelphia A's, who had uh, finally come out of the uh, uh, depression that they were in for all those years, and they had uh, by that time they had Al Simmons and Mickey Cochran, and, uh, Jimmy Fox, and Lefty Grove, and the Yankees only beat them out by a couple of games. Uh, I just I just thought of who it was, Clyde Barnhart. Clyde Barnhart, yeah. You're right. And he actually, for the season, out hit Kyler. Uh, he didn't, neither one of them was exactly, uh, had a batting title, was a batting title threat that year, but, yeah. but I think 
I uh, hit out hit him by five or ten points. And uh neither you know, I think Barnard probably played less than a hundred games. I think, but uh still he was a good he was a good a decent ball player, pretty good ball player. So it wasn't that uh you know, Bush didn't have a replacement in mind for Kyler when, when Kyler, you know, imposed his will. Uh but uh yeah, it was in, interesting. Now Cardinals bounced back in nineteen twenty eight. And they won a National League pilot and uh, uh, McKechnie, I think, finished that season as the manager of the Cardinals. Yeah, he's, yeah. He placed uh, Billy Southworth, I think, who started the season as the manager there. Yeah, I don't remember that. I think, I think you're right. Yeah, so McKechnie came uh, in the mid-season, and uh, uh, he had managed the Pirates to the World Championship in 1925, and now was managing the Cardinals. And they won the pennant uh, with Frankie Frisch, Jim Bylamley, and those that team. And the Yankees uh, obliterated them in the World Series that year. Uh, Ruth hit uh, uh, three home runs in a game. Uh, Garrick had over 500, and the Yankees just took them apart in the fourth straight as a payback for 1926. Yeah, actually, actually I think McKechnie was the, with the team the whole year. Uh, I'm not, but some, I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, but that uh, the, the Cardinals were were a very very good ball club. Once once Hornsby came on, starting in the early twenties, they threatened. Uh, year, you know, they were in, in the race year after year, and that carried over in, for for uh, another twenty five, thirty years. They were they became probably after McGraw's death. Um, case could be made that they were the class of the National League for the next uh, next twenty years or so. Yeah, they. Uh... Yeah, they uh, would you know would come back and uh, after 1929 and win in 1930 and 31. We'll get into that in a little while. The uh, 1929 was a, a strange season. The Yankees fell uh, the second place, way behind the uh, A's, uh, who won their first pennant since 1914, and. Uh, uh, one of the big tragedy of that season was that uh, Miller Huggins, who was the Yankee manager uh, f- during the 20s, uh, died uh, uh, about a week or two before that season ended. And the Yankees uh, were uh, somewhat lost without him being a manager. The Yankees would go three seasons before they won again in 1932. And the Cubs managed their first pennant since since nineteen uh since nineteen eighteen when they they won under their uh, rookie manager Joe McCarthy, who later of course would go on to manage the Yankees to uh both load of pennants. And uh, the Cubs uh that World Series was extremely interesting. And the the A's uh uh in game four, the A's were losing two games to one. In game four, and uh, they were losing eight to nothing in the seventh inning of game four at Wrigley Field. And they get, they got... Was it Wrigley Field or was it uh, Shy Park? I don't really remember. But they, won, they got ten runs in the bottom of the seventh inning. Uh, and that was the, the, the largest uh, number of runs that anybody got in an inning in the World Series until it was matched by the uh, uh, the Detroit Tigers in the 1968 World Series. And I think it still stands as the biggest late inning comeback. Yeah. In the World game. Yeah, that and was the, remarkable. And uh, uh, Max shocked, shocked the world when he started in the first game a pitcher named Howard Emke. We won seven games the whole season, and Emke came in and he struck out 13 and winning game one, and uh, that was the record until uh, 
the most strikeouts by a pitcher in a World Series game until Carl Erskine broke it in 1953 with 14. And then in the fifth game of that World Series, the uh, uh, the A's got three runs in the bottom of the ninth to beat the Cubs 3-2, and they wound up winning the uh, winning that World Series. And that started the Cubs on a routine of winning the pennant every three years and losing the World Series every time. Emke is one of the one of the, one of the all, you know fits into the class of pitchers we were talking about who had very solid careers in the twenties. Um, Emke, in fact, came came with within just a hair of pitching consecutive no hit games. Only an error behind him kept him from uh, having a back to back no hit uh, effort, and uh, was a very solid pitcher with some very very poor teams in the early 20s, and then near the end, tail end of his career got this very, very surprising and unexpected World Series start, which in some ways I think has always uh, helped uh, those who defend Mac as a great manager. Uh, they, they, the the incident gives them something to point to as an example of masterful strategy, and uh, really it doesn't seem to have been any more than just a hunch. But uh, because uh, Mac's key pitcher, strongest pitcher, of course, is Lefty Grove. But Mac always hesitated to start Grove against in the the opening game of an important series or against a uh, against a contender in a key game. Uh, If you look at examine Grove's career, and it really began to come to come to fruition in the 29-30 season. Uh, uh, a colleague of ours, Dick Thompson, wrote a book about Wes Farrell, uh, who didn't really come into prominence until the 30s, although he did, did come in in the 29th season, uh, and it made a case that Wes Farrell was actually a better pitcher overall than Lefty Grove, uh, because Farrell always faced the best teams and, and usually did very well against them. And Mack would not start Grove against the Yankees if he could all avoid it. Uh, we usually give them starts against the Browns and tail ending teams like, you know, Washington or whatever. And the Red Sox. Uh, mm. And the Red Sox, of course. Yeah. The Red Sox. Yeah. 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 And Tully was, Tully was traded to, uh, Tully was, you know, was, you know, peddled to the Red Sox and, uh, and to break up the Mac dynasty. But the early 30s, that's for a different, the different time we can discuss that. But the 29th season, as Al pointed out, was a fascinating season, and um, it also, of course, was, you know, here we are in, heading into, the, we're in the Depression now, and uh, what are, what's baseball going to do in starting 1930 to uh, really, you know, bring the fans, you know, put put fans in the seats at, at games, and what we <coughs> When we discuss the 1930s, we can get into that. If, and, you know, if, or do you want to discuss 1930 no, let's, today? No, let's, let's save that for next week. Yeah, I think that's Because good. Uh, that season in itself was uh, very, very unique. And Ian, you have some thoughts on uh, what 1930 was going to be, don't, don't you? Yeah, you know, you know what comes to mind in 1930? Uh, Hack Wilson. <laughs> He has that yeah. amazing season, and uh, that literally, um, you know, uh, begins a, a great decade of baseball. And uh, uh, but uh, you know, the depression ravished uh, uh, ticket sales, especially in Detroit. We'll get into, I guess, Hank Greenberg and uh, Navin, and uh, we'll get into all that uh, good stuff. That well, 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 the thing that struck me most about 1930 is that. Uh, the Philadelphia Phillies at 315 as a team and uh, won 52 games out of 154. Yeah. That's, Before uh, we get to the so we should we should note that uh, just touch upon the pitching again in the 20s and how, how, how it really started to change. Uh, up till even in, in for the late teens, pitchers were expected to go nine innings. Uh, as the 20s came on and, and during the progression of the decade, uh, the, the, the complete games leaders every season started to drop. Uh, the record for the fewest complete games up until the beginning of the 1920s was 28, I believe, 
and 1910 National League, and I think three pitchers tied for that, uh, Matthewson being one of them. And then maybe I think maybe Mordecai Brown was in there. But uh, in the 20s, the complete game leaders started to drop into the 20s. And in 1930, where we're going to begin next week, uh, the leaders in the National League were two very obscure pitchers by uh, modern standards, and they led with 22 complete games. That was, at that time, it set a new record low for the National League. The American League, had, I think, had uh, its own low earlier in the decade. And now it's two or three. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I just uh, I just want to say one last thing about the okay. 1920s, and then uh, we could end the show. Um, I think it's important to mention the Negro Leagues. Um, the first organized uh, Negro League was, of, of course, started uh, back in 1920, and they had, um, you know, they had teams, Chicago American Giants, the Chicago Giants, the Cuban Stars, uh, the Dayton Marcos, the Detroit Stars, the Indianapolis ABCs, of course, the Kansas City Monarchs and the St. Louis Giants. Lube Foster uh, ran the league. But this is very important because, again, you have Jim Crow laws, and they're not allowed to play. Uh, blacks are not allowed to play in the Major League Baseball since the 1890 agreement, Gentlemen's Agreement. But what this does is, in, in a nutshell, it, it can... It, what, what year was it? The Gentlemen's Gentleman. Agreement was 1890. So again, um, no, I'm not they were, familiar with that. I've never heard that. Yeah, there was, a, there was a gentleman's agreement of sorts, but it actually went into effect. Cap Anson supposedly introduced it, into, you know, after the 1884 season. But I don't know that it. Yeah, it's. Uh, it was never really. I you know there was something there were a lot. If we could if we get into that, we should, I mean, we really all should, should probably just spend. Uh, a uh, one program of our on hours. the Negro Leagues, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good but idea, the, Barry, so I'm glad you brought that up, Ian, because that really uh, – we we have been missing on that count. We really haven't given much uh, t- attention to a, a richly deserved subject. And, you know, and you know, Alan is in uh, – Alan's in my Facebook group, the Negro Leagues. I post every day in there. Um, I don't see you in there, Dave, on Facebook. I don't see um, you in my groups, but um, I sent you a friend request, and I'll get you in. But what I do want to see about the Negro. Yeah, I sent you a friend a friend request. You, okay. yeah. Send me another one because I, you know, I'll I'll look for it. I, I as Al knows, I go on Facebook about once every three years. But yeah, I, I'm, I going to, I'm going to yeah, start doing I, I, it. Because I'll put you in my groups, and then you can see when I post uh, daily. Because I, I, every day I post two things on the Negro Leagues, two things on the dead ball era. And this is very important because it creates a sense of community amongst the African-American population. That's a great site. I've learned an awful lot from it. Well, thank you, Alan. Yeah, you know, and I, 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 used to, when I, I was on trivia teams way back when. Uh, that was one of the areas that I handled was the Negro Leagues. And I've, you know, compared to what I knew back then, to compared to what I've learned from this site, is very, very, you know, I knew very, very little. You know, what I think I we all to... is because yeah. the, it took several scholars in the Negro Leagues. Some of the stats started to emerge and, uh, players previously who had never gotten any recognition at all have now, you know, uh, step forward to be, you know, proven to be stars uh, in the early part of the 20th century, particularly. It's it's a very important subject. It was posed to me uh, three years ago saying, you know, Ian, you have a couple of good groups. Why don't you start a Negro League? And I said, well, number one, I'm white. And number two, but this was done by African-American uh, followers of mine, and I did – and so you have all the curators from the Negro League Museum in the site. You have uh, players, uh, children, and nieces and nephews uh, of all the greats in there. And uh, it's really an important site because you've got people. Again, stats weren't, you know, totally kept. So you got people digging into their drawers and literally taking out what they have out of their drawers and putting it on the site, and I learn something new every day in it. So, 
so it's just it's just a wonder. Yeah, I'm I'm, look, I'm I'm sorry that I haven't seen it before, and I'm definitely going to look for it. Yeah, it's probably as soon as we get off here. Yep. Well, I'll put okay. you in. The, I, I Ian, put thank you. you so much for mentioning that. No, uh, well, you know, I like I said, I'm honored to be with you, gentlemen. You guys are the gurus of the baseball. I'm just the uh, I'm just the tag along. Don't well, kid yourself. You. An excellent. Don't yeah. kid yourself. <laughs> I wouldn't have invited you if I didn't think you could, you could contribute. Now you guys are the you guys. I've learned, I've learned more out of you guys than because I'm a lot younger than you. And I read your books and I knew who you guys were. And uh, uh, you guys jump started uh, my interest in research and all this other stuff. Um, I'm glad I do have my. Yeah, you did, Dave, especially in the um, in the dead ball era and stuff like that. And uh, Alan, I know, uh, did a lot in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, he lives in Brooklyn, my old uh, stomping ground where I grew up. But uh, my show comes out later, either this week or next week, um, on the Negro Leagues with uh, Arthur Leslie Hefty, who is the director. Oh, yeah, I know her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was on my the show the other day. Do women? You gotta do women in Negro League women or? Well, uh, I did Negro Leagues the other day. I'm doing women at the end of the month, and then I'm having another show with her at the end of April uh, to talk about the stars and the ending of the Negro Leagues and integration and how the Negro Leagues, without the integration of the Negro Leagues back in the 1950s, uh, baseball pretty much could have died. Um, I think the Negro Leagues and the integration saved the whole uh, uh, baseball league. We get into that uh, at a different time. Well, we had the Rocher that told them, uh, you know, when, when he, uh, you know, ripped them up for that petition in 1947, he said he's only the first. Yeah. 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 You know what Leo DeRocher told the Dodgers? I don't care if he's black, white, purple, yeah. red. I don't care if he looks like a zebra. As long as he can help this team, put he's going to play. Your, and put money in your pocket, yeah. 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 So he didn't care. And you know, by the way, I did get the Leo DeRocha book, uh, which... Yeah, my, I have that on pre-order, yeah. Yeah, I have the Leo DeRocha book by Paul Dixon. I spoke to Paul the other day. He's going to be on the show. I should, I should get you guys. I got Urban Shaka by uh, Steinberg. Yeah. He sent me the book. Yeah. So there's a lot of good baseball we're going to be talking about, gentlemen. A lot of good okay. stuff. Okay. I'll sign off now, and I want to thank you uh, for coming. And uh, same, next week, same bad time, same bad channel. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, you, Al. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. I know.